Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our next webinar segment of our summer series, I Teach, where we are talking about education, assessment, and current happenings in today's education market. My name is Allison Boyven, and I am on the marketing team here at Riverside Insights. I will be your host for today's webinar alongside another former educator, Anna Hausman. She is the group product marketing director here at Riverside Insights. If you missed our most previous webinar in the iTeach series, we had doc Dr. Kathy Welch join us to share the impact of COVID on longitudinal growth with student achievement, particularly in terms of months of unfinished learning, um, how to interpret score growth and understand the rate at which students are learning and growth goal creation with reports and scores for individual students and cohorts for program and instructional decisions. Today, we are really excited to welcome the principal from Clay County Christian Academy in Ashland, Alabama. She's gonna share with us the effects of COVID on their student testing plan, assessments that are positively impacting student growth and their data analysis in place, their process, as well as the key decisions being made in using the data. But before we get started and formally introduce her, we do have a few announcements to share. Throughout the summer, we have been presenting webinars on various education topics, including COVID's effect on math with unfinished learning, interpretation of assessment scores within reports, data meetings and strategies for analysis, and building a positive testing culture among staff. Be sure to join us for the remaining sessions as educators share their thoughts and perspectives on the given topic and look for our weekly webinar invites. During today's session, you may have questions that you would like our speaker to answer, and we definitely welcome those questions. Please type those into the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. It will look something like this image shown here on the left side. We will be sure to share those questions as the topic arises during today's discussion. There are also a few handouts with today's session. Those are located under the handouts triangle in the right side panel. So be sure to download those today during the webinar. Also today's session is being recorded and you will receive the recording, a copy of the slides, the handouts and a certificate of attendance in the next day or two. So be on the lookout for that email in your inbox. Also, recordings of our previous webinars, including those from this series, can be found on our website at info.riversideinsights.com backslash k12pd. And opening this page provides you with the header shown here. And now on to today's presentation and discussion. We are thrilled to have with us today, Cindy Roche. The principal of Clay County Christian Academy, part of the American Association of Christian Schools. And Cindy, I'll let you introduce yourself to our audience before we continue. Yes, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, like she had said, my name is Cindy Roach. I am the very proud principal over here at Clay County Christian Academy. We are located in Ashland, Alabama a uh, little rural town. Um, we're one of two private schools and we have three public schools in this area. My experience comes from, this is gonna be my seventh year at this school. And prior to that, I lived in Florida and that's where the bulk of my education experience has come from. So I did 20 years in the public school system there, uh, 15 as a classroom teacher, and five as an administrator. So um, very, very blessed to be here. And our school is a smaller school, but we um, have had some great growth. So we started about 112 students when I came seven years ago. And today we are at um, almost 250. So like 247 to be exact. We are pre-K through 12th school so we start with our fours and we get to see them graduate and move on from here so very exciting and uh, thank you so much for having me on here today well we are we are thrilled to have you here with us um it's great that you bring such a big uh, good perspective on 
um, education coming from the public schools 20 years um, and into the private schools as well. Um, and being a teacher and being an administrator, um, that's exciting too. So I wanna welcome also all the district and building administrators and the teachers who are joining us today. I know they're um, excited to hear your story. And so we appreciate them being part of the discussion and helping them get the school year off to a great start. So I know you shared a little bit about it already, but can you just add to um, telling us a, more about your school and um, grade levels and um, how your school came about? I know you have an interesting story of how it came about. Um, I do actually. So <clears throat> this school, so Clay County is very unique and they had different schools in different areas. So about 2002, there were four schools that the county had decided they were going to close and they wanted to merge into one. The community did not like that idea. Um, I think it's very uh, territorial around here. So, you know, they're very proud of where they come from, whether it's, you know, this part of the county or this part of the county. So they went to Mr. Paul Wellborn, who is the owner of Wellborn Cabinets, which is a very prominent cabinet business here in Ashland and asked him to essentially build a school. And his response was that he would do that. However, it was going to be private and it was going to be Christian. And that is how our school came about. We actually had a name change. So our school was built in 2003 and it was called Mellow Valley Christian Academy because that is one of the areas here. And then in 2007, they decided to change the name to Clay County because they didn't want the school, we didn't want the, the message to be that the school was just for Mello, whoever lived in Mellow Valley, it was Clay County, the whole county as a whole. So kind of a neat story. Obviously I was not here for all of that, um, but we have plenty of, it's very generational here. So we have a lot of families that have, um, grown up here and stay here, raise their kids here, grandchildren. Um, like I said, we're very rural. Our population is less than 2,000. It's a very small county. Um, I don't know where everybody else is from, but coming from Florida, you know, we I was in a very prominent county. So my district there had a, has over 40,000 students. <laughs> my webcam's working. Has over 40,000 students. Um, and here we have one high school that, you know, graduates about 120 versus my graduate, when my daughter graduated in our county, it was over 800. So big difference. Uh, we don't have a Walmart. We don't have a you know big grocery store. So just a very small town. Like I said before, we have pre-K all the way to 12, and we have one teacher per grade level, um, except for eighth grade this year. We had to split that grade. They got, the numbers got a little large. So we have two, and we offer a wide variety of sports as well. Um, as well as dual enrollment, scholarships. Um, so we do a lot for our little school. Um, we, you know, say with the Alabama standards, you know, we, we curriculum, all that we can talk about later as well. But so we have a, um, just a very unique school here um, and try to do the best we can with giving our kids the opportunities that everybody else has. Thank you. Yes, I, I did read a little bit about your sports program. Uh, I know you all are proud of um, being state champions in football and um, and basketball runners up as well. Yes, so. yes, yes, we are. <laughs> so Cindy, we would love to learn a little bit. Um, you know, the title of this webinar is kind of leading the way with data. And um, we're especially curious about how you all are infusing data into your 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 day to day world. Um, at your school from either from a school level to a classroom level. Um, so to, to start us off, um, we'd love to learn a little bit about what assessments are you even administering? Can you walk us through kind of your even assessment plan through the year and what type of data you're trying to collect with each of those assessments? Absolutely. So besides our, I guess our regular like classroom assessments that the teachers are responsible for, when I came to the school, they weren't very familiar with analyzing a lot of data. Um, so 
prior to COVID, our Iowa assessments had only been given in the spring, which I think is probably pretty common. And um, so we did that. And then we also implemented, and this has all really been since COVID. So that was probably, I guess, going into my third or fourth year we began to implement other assessments as well. So for instance, our primary grades, our pre-K, our kindergarten, our first, we began to implement a more of a diagnostic skill checklist. So we see a lot of children that come with a lot of different needs, a lot of gaps, and that's been more prevalent since COVID, which I'm sure everybody has seen that. So we use that as more of a monitoring tool. Um, we don't call it a placement test because that wouldn't be accurate. We don't place students anywhere but the grade that they're in, but it is a good monitoring tool, a good skills checklist to give the teachers kind of a starting point of where those students are at. And then they keep that throughout the year and use it as a monitoring tool. And that keeps them on track, keeps the students on track, and that's how we communicate with parents as well because we get a lot of homeschool students and a lot of times parents you know, might not have accurate data or they say their students are at one level, but they might not be. And that again has become more prevalent ever since COVID as well. So that's kind of how we do with our primary grade and then our elementary grades, we do guided reading. And we use a program, uh, Reading A to Z program, and they give benchmark assessments with that. So every elementary grade uses those. And that kind of gives them an assessment, a starting point, helps them to figure out what level that they're going to be in as far as reading level, book-wise, through, through that program. And then that's a monitoring tool throughout as well, determining how they move to the next level. Um, from COVID, is when they offered that you know September test because we couldn't do that spring that time and then that was that's always been my um, I guess kind of what I vote on is I feel like there's you should always have some comparable data and to be honest with you but prior you know even my first couple of years we really didn't do a whole lot with the spring data you know we looked at it we were like okay you know okay so and so did good class did okay we showed some growth and then the school year ended and we just kind of moved on now when we did the fall test i kind of advocated for fall and spring so we can use that as more of comparable and it kind of gives the whole picture you know the 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 whole child picture so yeah we don't expect our scores to be you know, I guess rocking off the charts in September because, you know, we just started, but then we should see a lot of growth come March. So um, we test all of our students. Kindergarten was kind of new the past couple of years. We used to just do the practice test with them. And um, I hired a new kindergarten teacher a couple of years ago and she really, she wanted to test them. She was like, I really want to see where our kids are at. Um, clearly they don't take the reading part in in september you know um but it really did it was really a good comparison as far as um helping the teachers and it gives us that good baseline in the fall and then that way we're, we're able you know it, it kind of does a lot as far as like i said it gives us the baseline and then we can move forward from there. And then by the time spring comes, then we're really able to sit down and analyze data. And that to me is more valid than just that one time a year. No, that's fascinating. So you're really providing a beginning of year and end of year benchmark and, and, and looking at the growth in between. Um, do you feel like the shift in assessment programming and planning has impacted like positively impacted the way teachers are even thinking about instruction in the classroom like how has that how has the shift of moving from just giving the iowa assessments in the spring to giving iowa both fall and spring kind of change even what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis in the classroom yeah i absolutely think it's been a positive change because like i said before i think they didn't really see the validity in taking the test, except that was just what we're supposed to do. Like, you know, we take the one time a year and okay, we're good. Um, and it really wasn't explained. And then they didn't really know how to analyze data. And my experience, I come from a very big data driven county. 
And so we looked at all kinds of data all the time, charted it, analyzed it. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, come in here and be overkill, but in the same sense, I wanted them to understand, like, we're not just, we don't just do things to do them. So yeah, it has definitely positively changed because now they can look at it and they understand what those domains mean. They understand those levels. And I just shared with them, yesterday was our first day back. And I just shared with them, like one of the um, areas that is showed our weakness across the board was vocabulary. So then we were able to brainstorm ideas of like, well, okay, what can we do? Like, this is an area we need to get better at. So what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to incorporate more vocabulary here. We're going to do, we're going to map it out here. You know, so some teachers still in the younger grades are maybe focused or the upper elementary was maybe focused more on spelling and they need to be focused more on vocabulary and the meanings of words. So I think now they're able to see how impactful it can be. And then they look and they say, okay, oh, you know what? I didn't teach maybe I didn't do a really good job or didn't spend enough time in this area. Maybe I should, should do that before it was just, okay, here's my student's test. Okay. Oh, let's pack up for the end of the year and we're good to go. I don't have those kids anymore next year anyway. So I definitely see that my teachers are buying in more and um, they're kind of excited to see those May results um, because they really want to show that, um, see how much they've grown and then look at individual students as well. So it's creating almost more purposeful instruction throughout the year because teachers understand kind of where they're coming from and where they're headed. Correct. Correct. And administering all of those subject areas, right? Thank you, administer Iowa assessments complete. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yes, ma'am. So that's kind of gives you, as you mentioned, that whole picture with reading and science and math and social studies kind of at the beginning of the year, right? With um, where students are with within all of their skills and all of the subject areas um, in order to provide that data going forward. Right, because I think my experience um, before in public school is they had certain subjects for certain grades. And so what started happening was those teachers of those certain grades spent more time in the great in the subject that they were going to be tested on. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I mean that that's really what happened. You know, if, if you're teaching, if you're getting tested on science, well, you're gonna make sure that that science is taught every single day. But if you're not being tested on writing, well, you know, so that kind of I saw a lot of that throughout the years. Um, but here, like I said, one of the things about Iowa that I like is it's that whole picture. So you're able to teach like you're supposed to, you know, teach your standards, and then the students get tested in all the subjects. So you can see, you know, their specific strengths and weaknesses in each subject, not just one or two. So with these assessments, um, can you share a little bit, um, and you alluded to it, um, any more specifics about the structures in place in looking at, um, the data that you gather um, and describing that process for administrators and teachers to kind of dig in and look at those specific scores. Yes, yeah, so a lot of, like I said, it's, um, and when you're part of a small school, um, you don't have a district behind you, you don't have curriculum specialists, you don't have, you know, you just don't have, you don't have people that are, um, <clears throat> you know, data, you know, train or their job is specifically that you just don't have all that. Like I said, luckily, um, I come from a district like that. And I do have a degree in that curriculum, professional development and assessment. So bringing all of that here, it's really me, you know, it's, it's so and I have to do things kind of in a, you know, um, step by step. So I started with really just having individual teacher meetings. And I think that is probably the most impactful in the beginning. And um, I know it takes a lot of time, um, but I do, you know, I carve out, I have a staff of about 24. So it's, you know, not, I know it's not huge, but I'm able, I am able to meet with them individually. Now, obviously if I had more than one in a grade group, I'd meet with them grade group wise, but then I'm able to show them what their reports really mean 
and what they need to look at. Um, because, you know, it can be overwhelming. You're looking at everything and they don't understand sometimes what all of those mean. And then with me helping them, then they're able to help parents as well. And so fall, I kind of do that as a whole group. And then when spring comes, I kind of mesh that with their end of the year evaluation. So we look at the scores, we talk about the year, you know, I make it a whole teacher meeting. And then we look at it holistically. So, you know, as a grade, as their whole class, and then we look at it student by student. Because what I want them to get out of it is not just, oh great, my class showed growth. I really want them to look and say, oh, you know, this surprises me about, you know, this area surprises me here. Or, oh wow, this, this, this is great. Like I'm gonna keep, you know, doing what I'm doing here. And then when they look at students, I want them to understand a little bit more as, as far as their students as well, especially in the fall. Like, oh, I see this area could be an area of weakness for this student. Um, so it's kind of like, what are their surprises? What are their aha moments? And what, what are things that, they, you know, that's affirmation for them as well? So a lot of times we find that it's a, it's a pretty good true representation. So, and there's always reasons and we know that, you know, we know that there's, you know, we don't know what goes on the night before they have to take the test. We don't, you know, that, but the teacher knows. And so sometimes they'll say, ooh, you know, I know they've been struggling in this area or they had some family issues, you know, all of that. And we understand that they're kids. And, um, but I feel like with the fall tests, they're able to, like I said, really see those strengths, really see those weaknesses and kind of hone in on those. And then hopefully we don't see the same in the spring. And that's kind of what I think they get excited to look at. And they're like, oh, this student, you know, all right, you know, they passed, they did great on this. Look at the growth they did here. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I, I mean, I've had teachers, you know, to be 100% honest, I've had teachers that have said, ooh, I didn't even realize, you know, I didn't realize I should have been doing more of this or that. Um, so I think just being able to look at data and not have it be so scary and um, looking at more of the like, you know, the grade equivalent, um, the domains and the cognitive levels, just really look, honing in on those just to see, then, then they're able to, like I said, be able to um, give them opportunities in their teaching as well um, to help those students so they can show the growth. So it's really just been myself training and then of course, you know, the webinars on the AACS that help out as well. How often do they receive training, the teachers? Do they, they get it at the beginning of the year or is the webinar something they can go back and review on their own or? Yeah, us yeah usually um, we do a lot of training in the beginning. Um, so like yesterday we did a whole group because it was their first day back. They sit you know, all day long and we do, we break out, we have breakout sessions. They do training over the summer because those webinars are really, um informative and they offer those a lot in the summer so a lot of them will do that and then there's a couple of them that if i um you know purchase or whatever that we can do after school starts so that's really it's really the summer and the beginning of the year um after that it's you know you know how busy it gets after that so sure Absolutely. Um, and I wanted to ask about um, vertical teams. Do your teachers after spring testing, in particular, when they get the scores, maybe in the summer, um, talk to the next year's teacher and get to share, you know, with the diagnostic data in the fall or just before that, you know, here's where I found maybe are some skill gaps or things. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we started that just a couple of years ago, I, I want to go a little deeper with that. I want it to be, that's an area where we're going to probably document a little bit better. Right now, it's a lot of that like informal conversation, but I know how important it is. So that's an area where um, I know like we're going to work on and it's going to be more of a like formal meeting and you know, these are some specific things that they're going to pull out. Right now, it's been a little more informal. Um, but yes, they do meet and they do say, you know, hey, these are the errors. Or, you know, that they talk a lot about individuals. Like, I know this one, you know, showed this here, but, you know, mm, he shows a little bit more of this. You might have to do this to, for motivation. 
and stuff like that. And then in our high school, they work very closely together because there's only one per, you know, per grade level or one per subject as well. So they work closely together. So a lot of times they will come together as a team and they will say, oh, well, yeah, I see why, you know, their science scores are, are you know, off the chart, but, ooh, look at their math scores. So what can we do better in those areas? Because they see those kids as a whole versus just, you know, oh, first grade just sees first grade. So that, that has a benefit for the high school because they have them all six years, really, you know, because they go from seven through 12. So, and then how do you make, like, so you talked a little bit about kind of like what the teachers are doing in the classroom. How do you make whole school decisions based on the data? Um, you know, how, if you're, if you're looking at data growth trends over time, when and, and how are you kind of making decisions to modify curriculum to, um, you know, change groupings? Like, how, can you talk a little bit about your, your process there at the school level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're a little, you know, we're fortunate as far as um, I can make a lot of those decisions. I know sometimes depending on what the background is, I know in public schools, you don't have a lot of choice on curriculum and things like that. I do. So this past year, um, we did all of our curriculum mapping. So every grade level, every subject, you know, we mapped out our entire curriculum. So although we're private, and although we're Christian, we still use the Alabama state standards for obvious reasons. You know, we want to make sure that our kids are getting what they need. Our, our teachers are, you know, um, teaching what they're supposed to be teaching. So we always make sure everything matches as far as the standards and our curriculum. So I look at I look at a variety of things. I look at all, because I know everything is one piece. You know, it's one piece to the puzzle. So I look at all of it as a whole. And that is really how I make my decisions on, you know, is this curriculum giving us everything we need? Do we have to go a little bit outside the curriculum? Do we have to pull in um, different things? Like, for instance, I know I said vocabulary earlier, but that is an area. So, okay, well, if our curriculum only spends, you know, a little bit of time on a couple of vocabulary words, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to supplement that? So I have a little bit of an advantage that I'm able to have that freedom and have that choice to, to do those things. And then another big, um, I guess, passion of mine is the way that we have to differentiate instruction. So we differentiate instruction by, you know, the reading groups, the centers, you know, just making sure that their lessons are going to reach each and every student. And so all of that info comes from all of our diagnostic assessments. Um, I have a lot of experienced teachers. So they will come to me when, you know, we have our conversations and they'll say, hey, you know, I think I need this. I think I need that. You know, what can I beef this up in this area? Sometimes we have to change schedules around to best meet, like a perfect example is kindergarten. Um, we had their subject areas kind of broken up throughout the day. After the first month, my kindergarten teacher was like, look, I'm not getting anything out of them after lunch. Can I move my math up to before lunch? And, you know, kind of give them a little bit of a rest time, you know, whatever. And I said, yeah, let's try it. And what a difference. So it's, it's, it's those decisions there. Um, like I said, I have a little more freedom probably than, than a lot. but those, um, the decisions as far as curriculum and, you know, programs and things like that all come from, like I said, the whole picture, making sure that we are meeting our, our, our meeting each of our students' needs. Um, you have to monitor that student performance. Sometimes, you know, it's not all about the student. Sometimes it's about the teacher. So sometimes I have to really look at, you know, do I have the right person in the right position? Um, you know, some teachers just, just, you know, they're comfortable in certain areas and not in others. So all of that, you know, our whole goal is to see growth in all of our students. And so kind of my philosophy is whatever I need to do, I'm going to do to ensure that that happens because they are coming to us with so many different needs and so many different levels. 
Um, it's hard to have that one, you know, they're definitely not cookie cutter. So you can't have that one thing that's just going to have all your answers. So you constantly have to be growing and, and searching and, and reviewing and analyzing. So that's kind of how I, how I go about, you know, making the, but it's a year long. I mean, it's, I feel like it's never over. I don't just look at it in August and look at it in May. Um, that comes from a lot of, you know, visits, evaluations, you know, just looking at each piece just to make sure I see the whole picture, not just a piece of data here and there. So at, kind of at the school level, how are you monitoring student growth throughout the year? And this might lead into some of the reports soon, but um, how, how are you showing that students are actually making growth so that the spring assessment isn't necessarily a surprise? Mm -hmm. So I do, I, I, I have all the reports. Um, so I look at those reports. I may, um, I like to chart things. <laughs> so I kind of pull out my data and I make charts so I can keep up. And so I do it by student and then I do it by grade. So I'm able to see, okay, well, this is where we're at. And then I leave a little space for the spring, you know, now I don't, um, I don't go and write out every single thing they're weak in, every single thing they're strong in. I, I don't do all of that. Um, but like I said, for right now, that's how I can kind of keep my put my thumb on it. And then I am in classrooms a lot. Um, I have multiple conversations with teachers a lot. So I'm always like we're always talking, we're always sharing, even if it's not in a formal meeting, not everything has to be like I don't schedule every single um, conversation but there's a lot of times we talk and we talk about certain students i kind of keep my thumb on the ones that are the lower achieving um first because i guess like i said obvious reasons they struggle and so we want to make sure like are we meeting their needs i don't want their gap to get bigger so um so it's a lot of intervention. It's a lot of making sure that teachers are pulling those students. I have a couple of teacher assistants that work with my younger grades, so I will pull them um, and give them the lower students, you know, that need some remediation and they work with them because, again, I don't have an interventionist. I don't, you know, there's mm -hmm. just a lot of staff members I, I'm not privileged of having. However, I try to use my people as much as I can in areas that I can, because we do allow students um, with special needs here, you know, with, with um, individual education plans. So we have to meet those. So there's just a lot that I try to really make sure and just keep up with. And with having the number of students I do, mm -hmm. even though it's only myself, I'm able to do that right now. So Cindy, we've actually had quite a few questions come in the chat um, that I would love to infuse while we're kind of on this topic. Um, what specific interim data are you using to monitor growth throughout the year? Are you guys giving assessments that you're creating in-house? Are you giving another standardized assessment? What, what are you using? We don't do any other standardized assessments except with what comes with the reading program that we do. Everything okay. is based off of um, what the teachers give based on their curriculum. So a lot of it comes from our curriculum. Some are okay. teacher-made assessments. And then besides our the ones I talked about earlier with the primary grades, they either use that one consistently throughout the year so they can see that pre, mid, and post data. Um, but the rest are the classroom assessments, um, but no other like standardized tests, no. Okay, so it's more the connection to the or assessments that are connected to the curriculum. Um, Correct. As, as interim, and then, um, if somebody is interested in learning a little bit more about the process that you went through to map to do curriculum mapping um was that you know for all of the grades that's a that's a big feat and a big task was that something that you did independently or did you pull in different leaders across the school to support with that work we did so i actually um i purchased a program called curriculum track and if you use it, it has a lot of different um, program or uh, sorry curriculum on there. We primarily use BJU, and so it has that on there. So what it does is it, it downloads, uh, kind of like front loads a lot of that for you. 
So for instance, if it says, you know, chapter one is, you know, fractions, it'll have the fractions and have the learning objectives. And you just have to kind of click and move it around to put it in the order that you teach and then go ahead and add the standards to it and add any kind of resources. So I had a little bit of, of front loading that I didn't have to, you know, we didn't have to go in and recreate the whole thing, but we still had to make it ours. Um, so yes, it was a big feat. Um, we do, we are part of an accreditation process every five years. And that was one of the areas when, you know, I came at the first accreditation and now we're getting ready to do our second one in November. And that is one of the areas that um, we needed to really work on was our, was our curriculum. So the mapping piece, um, I put a lot of time in. And again, but I, yes, I had every teacher who taught, like my first grade teacher worked with me for first grade, my second grade, you know, um, because they are, the experts in their subject so they're able to say oh no we need more in this or nope I, I i don't even i moved this over here because it makes sense to to go with this subject you know this strand so so yes i did pull all of my teachers in for that um but yeah it, it was a big feat but we got it done and, and, and it, it's a it's you know i think it's done for now but it's always going to be something we work on and, and work towards and change and, and look at so so it was curriculum track is really what helped us get started often often thank you um i'm curious to know um since COVID, have you noticed any areas in particular maybe with skills or a subject area in which um your students uh have shown a significant decrease in scores um i know a lot of the just national data shows math in particular, but I was curious if, if that kind of matches what you see at your school and, and if teachers are then participating in additional professional development, for example, to get, gain instruction in that area. Yes, I was just going to say math, 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 um, for sure. Um, we have seen a little bit in reading as well for our little ones. Um, like I said before, I think we get a lot of um, students that, well, I think after COVID, you know, parents kept them out and then they were worried. And then our, our district, our public schools went to um, virtual. So they were like two days in class, three days virtual. So I just think that created a huge gap in our younger ones the foundationally. And so we saw, you know, they did not have their phonics. They do not have, they did not have their reading. So we saw a big decrease in that as well. And so, yes, professional development has been huge. Um, not only do I try to participate in any kind of webinar or anything that we can that, you know, is offered to us, BJU has an exchange conference every year and they do a multiple, it's like a three day and you can do it all virtually. Um, all different types. So I encourage all of my teachers to go on there. I know it's the summer. Not every single person, you know, does it. It's their summer, but a lot, quite a few do, and they get to pick and choose which sessions they're a part of. Um, and then I sent one of my teachers this summer to a Kagan workshop in Florida for math because she is our math teacher for the upper elementary. And she came back very excited, you know, had a lot of good instructional strategies to um, implement. So again, budget wise, we're a little tight. Uh, so I have to be careful, but I try to do as, as much PD, you know, as I can afford and I can, you know, expose them to. So, but yeah, math is definitely the, the weakest, but we did see a big decrease in those foundational skills with the little ones coming in as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm yeah makes sense um thinking with in terms of iowa assessments in particular um can you share with us any uh reports and scores um you mentioned i think grade equivalent earlier um but can you elaborate maybe on that and um when you're meeting with these teachers during the year to look at their data what are some of these conversations like in terms of their reports and scores yeah, absolutely. So we, um, so those are the ones we kind of look at. So the class performance profile, the summary, the list of student scores. We also have um, the profile like narrative and the individual student reports because, you know, we have some, of course, that go home with parents. But the grade equivalent, 
is something that, and I know they um, kind of train on that in, in the webinar that AACS gives out, but the grade equivalent is to something that we do look at because it kind of, you know, like I said, I know there's not anything that's set in stone 100%, but it does really give a good baseline. And, and usually they're pretty accurate as far as like where teachers feel like their students are. So when we look at that, like for instance, um, I'll take a student who was in, you know, first grade last year and who seemed to be very high academically, um, was at the highest reading level, um, seems to, you know, breeze through the math curriculum, just as one of those, you know, straight A's, you know, all of that. So when we look at her scores, we look and we're like, oh, look at that grade equivalent, you know, first grade 2.5. Okay. So teachers like that makes a hundred, you know, that makes sense. She's in second grade fifth. I, I understand that because she's like breezing through our curriculum. Um, a lot of times at that point, just to kind of go off for just a minute on that point, Sometimes we have to do, you know, we talk a lot about our lower students, but then we have to also challenge our, our higher students as well. You know, I don't want them sitting there just being bored, you know, peer tutoring a lower student. Like, what are we doing to challenge them? So that's a whole nother conversation that we have and teachers implement. And that's where those centers and that differentiated instruction work so well. Um, but that's like, that's conversation we have, you know, we, like I said, we look at it as a class overall. And they always want to see that growth first. Like, oh, I was at, you know, 1.0 and the thing, now I'm at a 1.9 or, you know, 2.0, great. So they kind of, you know, see that if it happens to where they don't show growth, then that's a different conversation on, okay, let's really look at why. Um, it doesn't happen too often, I'm going to be honest, because I think, you know, in fall, like I said, you know, they, they don't, they don't have that knowledge yet of that grade level. So the scores are usually, you know, kind of low. The only issue we would have with that would be our high school. And that happened this year. So one of the examples would be like my 11th grade class in the fall, they scored 13 plus, And that's a hundred percent. I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. And then come spring, they scored 11.1. .1. So we're like, hmm. <laughs> And I think for them, um, it's more of a motivational issue. You know, high school is a little bit of a different, different breed. And so theirs is more of a motivational issue. Um, so again, that's, you know, it's all these conversations come out of this data. Okay, what can we do? What, you know, how, cause we can't just let the kids, the 11th grade students, you know, we know we can see how they've been the whole time. The 13 plus did not surprise us at all. You know, there could be probably five valedictorians sitting in that class. So why are they showing a decrease, you know? Um, so yes, so, so we use that. And then we look at the students individual as well. And that of, I'm looking at my reports, the list of student scores really breaks it down by the actual subjects. So then teachers can then have a conversation of, okay, so language, Yep, that one was a little lower, but look at their vocabulary or vice versa or math. Oh, computation, that makes sense. Um, so like I said, now they're getting more comfortable. And so using those, these reports don't seem to be so overwhelming. Um, and they're able to really pull out the information that they feel like they can use to help their students, um, you know, fall for the rest of the year and then for spring to go ahead and, and share with the teacher for the following year. Do you use these um, with parents as well? You mentioned the, I think, individual um, one report that you send home with parents, but um, performance profile narrative. Um, but do you all use them with the parents during conference time or um, and help them interpret the scores? We do. The first couple of years I was here, you know, you printed off this nice little paper that explained things and kind of sent it home. Uh, but now we, the teachers meet more with the with the parents and not everybody, you know, there's some that, you know, I mean, they just, it doesn't bother them. They don't really ask a lot of questions, but then others are, 
you know, uh, very invested. And so they want to know anything and everything they can. So now that the teachers are more comfortable and they understand it, they're able to explain it to parents better. That's why those first couple of years, we kind of set home a paper like, hey, this is how you can interpret this. Um, but now that, you know, they use it and they understand it in the past few years, you know, they're, they're able to really meet with their parents and feel comfortable. And um, it's not all coming from me. And then they're able to use this piece as well as all the other pieces of data that they use in their classroom along with teacher observation to, you know, be able to paint that whole picture for, for their, you know, student or their child as well. And do students get to see their scores and understand their scores as well? They do, of course, depending on the grades. Um, sure. You know, we, we don't do, you know, anything, any formal meetings, you know, again, our high school students just kind of are like, okay, I think, you know, we're still trying to kind of find the balance with them because I, you know, they're smart enough to understand that it's not going to really, like, they don't, they don't get retained. It doesn't go on their report card. You know, it doesn't stop them. They don't go into a different class. So sometimes it's it's a little tricky to kind of get them to be like, hey, do your best. This is important. This is an important piece. You know, the ones that do their best on everything, we have no issue. Um, but it's, of course, the ones that, you know, are like, well, is it going to impact my life? No. So, you know, um, so there are some. And like I said, it usually goes along with their parents. It's usually, especially the older ones, will have a parent and the student come in and then talk to, to them and um but we have not, I know back when I was in public school, we had done student-led conferences where students talked about their schoolwork and their data. And, you know, we've, we've not gotten to a place like that yet. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, for the ones that are very invested, they, they, they absolutely understand. So um, kind of one of our final topics that we wanted to talk with you about um, is, you know, we've talked about giving the Iowa assessments at the beginning of the year, the end of the year, and then all of these different interim um, assessments that you're giving in between. Um, are you triangulating this achievement data with any other data pieces? Are you looking at, you know, ability data or SEL information or, you know, class um, attendance? Like what, what other pieces of data are you triangulating together? To ensure you have a really good understanding of um, a student a student growth yeah we have a few pieces as far as like i talked about earlier like you know their class assessments their performance in class you know the, their report card grades um attendance is is a big issue um not really a big issue i guess i should say but it is a big piece and then, of course, if the student has um, any type of indica individual education plan, um, we look at that as well. Or maybe there's some socio-emotional, you know, so there's just, there's so many different areas of to try to, especially if there's a discrepancy somewhere, you know, we really try to see, okay, well, what other pieces are there? Because like I said before, there's not one, you know, one piece that shows the whole picture. Um, you know, being a private school and being a Christian school does not mean that, you know, we have students that are all, you know, entitled or from these, you know, great, beautiful homes. You know, we have a lot that, um, you know, just come with a, with, with a, just a lot of stuff, you know, like everybody else has. And so sometimes we have to really kind of dig deep and, and that's the, I guess the the blessing of having you know a smaller school is that you really do get to know these kids and their families um and so you're able to kind of form you know a whole picture but um attendance seems to be with some students seems to be our probably our biggest hurdle i have had to put a lot of attendance policies in place because they we just have a lot of you know we do have about a handful of students that have a lot of absences and when i look at their test grades and it doesn't matter if it's iowa it doesn't matter if it's a classroom assessment it, it shows you know the performance is is low um so those are special meetings that i have with parents um i even publish dates of our iowa assessments like right now you could look on i mean our calendar's done it shows you and i'll still have parents come and say oh we planned a vacation that week and i'm just like oh 
Um, so there's a little bit of that, but um, but like I said, you know, we, we really try to identify the strengths, um, all of our, you know, all of our areas of weaknesses and just really come up with what is the best plan that is going to meet the needs of these students. And then there are just times where, you know, every once in a while you just have that big question mark. You know, you have no idea. You're like, I don't know, you know, this this student does this, this, and this. There's no reason. And, you know, every once in a while, you, you know, you just have that where you're like, you know, we, we've done everything we can, you know, especially, like I said, I don't, I'm not downing my high schoolers. I love them. Like I said, when they get to be that senior, there's just times where, I mean, you can do whatever you want. They're just going to do what they do. I mean, that's just the way it is versus a kindergartner who's probably going to cry if they don't do their best, you know? So yeah, so that's kind of, you know, we, we look at everything and, and teachers collaborate quite a bit. And so just really trying to help each other because they're, there's only one of them. So they, you know, they really try to look to each other for some support and help and, hey, what are you doing? And um, so, so that's kind of, you know, the bulk of how we, we look at all of that. What do you do if a student, you know, performs really well on, um, in class, but doesn't perform as well on the Iowa assessments? How do you navigate that gap that you're seeing with the student performance? Mm -hmm. So that's always a um, an interesting question. I think it brings up a lot of different um, what people believe in like philosophies and things like that. Sometimes um, I kind of go to the teacher first because a lot of times I want to make sure that um, you know, what is going on in the classroom? Are the assessments and work, I mean, is it, is it too easy? You know, are they, you know, are they grabbing, you know, they're getting all these straight A's and then they're showing they're, you know, two years behind on, on an assessment, mm, you know, that's usually, that's usually not the case. So um, a lot of times I feel like it, it kind of does fall back on the teacher and I go to them first and I say, okay, you know, let's, let's talk about this. Is this indicative? Because I'm looking at, you know, honor roll, I'm looking at report card grades, you know, you're showing me these assessments. So then I take a deeper look at, well, let's see how, and, you know, like, and, and a good example of that is um, she's not, you know, it's a teacher that was here years ago, but um, they were constantly giving retake, 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 retake. So, you know, the student would, you know, get, do a test and maybe, you know, not do well. And then she would give it again. And, you know, really like almost like until they got a good grade. Um, and that was like my first couple of years. And I did not know, you know, at first that was going on, obviously. So that's not a true indication. I mean, I think anybody who takes something five or six times is going to eventually get an A. I mean, that's just, you know, common sense. So I kind of look at that first. And then if it's really, you know, one of those things where we're like, no, you know, the student's doing pretty well, the, the, you know, everything seems to match up there. Then we look at, okay, you know, what, what is going on? Was it something, was it a comprehension? Was it something that happened the night before? And then we have conversations with those students. Like, hey, tell me what was going on when you were taking this test. Nine times out of 10, students will tell me they just got very anxious. Um, you know, maybe that test anxiety kind of came out. So for us, you know, you have to be careful because you push too much and then you have your ones that worry so much that it gets them, you know, gives them some anxiety. They don't do well versus if you don't push enough, then you have the other ones that are like, eh, it doesn't really mean a lot, you know, so you kind of have to balance it. Um, but yeah, but, but like I said, you know, it's it's all conversation and just really seeing like, okay, what is going on? And a lot of the times, especially now, you know, I kind of know what's um, what's going on in the classroom and what kind of assessments they're giving. So if we do see a discrepancy like that, nine times out of ten, it, it's something that's going on with the student maybe on that day. As we um, come to kind of the close of uh, this session today. Can you share with us any final key insights that you've discovered from data analysis um, from the assessments administered during the year, especially the 
Iowa assessments, um, but others too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have seen a lot of growth and um, I was actually very excited that the fall and spring testing was available. Like I said, I'm a big advocate of, you know, kind of like that pre and post test. I think that's a, a, a great way to measure. So, you know, being able to see the growth year to year and being here and having students, you know, testing in kindergarten and if, you know, they stay with us to be able to kind of just see their growth over because what we've noticed is if a student, if maybe they struggled a little bit in K and one, but then all of a sudden we look at their fourth grade and they're like, you know, just doing tremendous, you know, you celebrate that. And then, you know, sometimes we see, wow, this, you know, student started off super high and they've stayed that way. And, and you know, so it it is, it's really neat to see, and we are fortunate to see that. It's really neat to see the year and year, you know, from year to year, um, the growth that they show. And, like I said, just really um, just celebrating the fact that now we have all these different you know, pieces of data and we understand how to use them. And it seems like it's more valid and it shows the teachers you know, the validity behind it and that it's actually being used to impact instruction and um, you know, teacher strategies and you know, student motivation. So, I just think that is something, you know, we've come a, a long way and I know we have a long way to go, but I think, you know, we've really come a long way. So I think, you know, my, my aha moment was just really sitting down and saying, okay, you know, I have to get them to, to buy in and help have them understand, you know, really how to use these and what the purpose is, but also understand that this is just, you know, one piece of the puzzle. So. So having that diagnostic data at the beginning kind of gives you that that starting point to have somewhere to go in terms of the growth for the year. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And teachers now see the value um, and not just having the end the end goal in mind, but where is their starting point? Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. All right. Um, are there any other, looking at the Q&A box, any other um, questions that we want to, uh, I don't see I don't any. I think we got them all answered. Um, thank you everyone for your engagement. Lots of great questions coming in in the chat today. Well, thank you. Um, we are coming up on close of time here, um, but thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, Please stay tuned for our upcoming um, final iTeach webinars for this summer, as well as um, hear from your peers webinars this school year as districts and school leaders sharing uh, practical strategies for looking at student data and ways to maximize student growth with assessments. And how are you all getting ready for the new school year? What assessment data are you looking at uh, to learn about your students this fall and how is that data it's being gathered, impacting decisions that you are making at the district or school levels. So share with us your success stories. We'd love to hear them. Um, and the data meeting plans for your school year and assessment celebrations with your students. So tag us on social media. Let us know of the great things happening. And is there anything else, Cindy or Anna, you want to add? Just thank you, Cindy, for joining us today. We really learned a lot. Um, and I think, you know, what you shared was just very informative and will hopefully help schools all across the country. So I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it as well. And I know we're all in this together. So none of us has all the answers, but I think all together, we probably have quite a bit of answers. So thank you again for having me. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I know you all have some growth celebrations that you all do too. So um, just another tidbit to add to that part of the conversation. Um, to celebrate after all that longitudinal growth, um, celebrate throughout the school year. So thank you again, everyone. And um, we hope to see you again for another webinar. And until next time, have a great rest of your day and have a great week. Thank you. You too, bye-bye.